I got into aviation when I was 16 years old. That's when I took my first flight lesson. I uh, did a lot of research into what it would take to get your private pilot's license, and I started looking around Syracuse area, and that's when I found uh, Syracuse Flight School, and followed by that was the Syracuse Flying Club. When I was about six years old, I took a flight on a uh, Delta Airlines MD-80 from Syracuse to Atlanta, actually. And during that flight, the captain, the flight attendant, the first officer, all were very kind, very nice, and actually let me sit up in the cockpit as a uh, eager six-year-old would love to do. They just decided to sit in the cockpit, screw around with the buttons. I mean, they let me turn on and off the fast seatbelt sign, landing lights, all that stuff. Explained everything from dials, switches, throttles, cables, all that stuff. It was great. Um, it was kind of the point at which I knew this was what I wanted to do for a career. Uh, drawing pe what, it, what draws people into aviation? The closest thing I can relate it to would be when you go in a boat, you kind of feel an escape from everything else, whether it's fishing or just out having fun. And I think a lot of people that come to the general aviation side of flying airplanes um, look for that escape. And some people find that escape and are like, wow, this, this is awesome. Why, why don't I just do this for a career and end up pursuing it? My favorite part of aviation, sharing it with other people. Um, taking, before I left to finish my ratings, um, taking people flying was one of my major hobbies. I took a bunch of friends up, family members up, taking trips, going and getting the famous $100 burger, going from point A to point B, landing in a new state, seeing new areas. That's, that's really what it's about. We, we as a society get very caught up in just using it as a mode of transportation, and it is. It's a very useful mode of transportation, but just when you actually fly the airplane and take someone else with you and share that joy that you see in it with them, it's completely different. If you're going to do it as a hobby, um, figure out what you're getting into. Uh, the initial sticker shock of flight training um, can be very surprising. The thing that you should keep in mind though that is you're going to get what you put in as far as training goes. So if you're looking at someone that may be very cheap, there may be something that uh, you're not seeing. And as a private pilot, you know, it's very easy to see, oh, this guy's cheaper than this guy. That may not be good. So just uh, do some digging and look around. Flying clubs are a great way to cut down on cost and meet, meet a lot of people and get your private pilot certificate. Now, as far as making it a career, um, also do your research. The career of aviation is a very dynamic one with um, events such as 9-11 and the decline in the stock market around 2008 very hard times on aviation and it it wasn't directly well at least the one in 2008 wasn't directly related to a cause like it wasn't like another September 11th it was something outside and it affected it um, and then as far as the career goes also make sure that you put in the time and the effort into studying the material it's it's a very very dynamic environment flying and you can never stop learning. You have to sharpen your skills every day. If you're unsure of something, don't take it by the wayside. Make sure you look into it and figure it out. Uh, a lot of acronyms. All right, so I'm a CFI, I, -I MEI with a high performance uh, tail wheel endorsement. And my instrument rating ties into that, obviously, because it's the double uh, I portion of it. 
Um, so what that means is I can fly commercially for a company, or I could instruct, which I'm currently doing now. Um, I can teach anything that has two engines, that uh, has one engine. I could even instruct in tailwheel airplanes if I so wished. Um, it's instructing in itself is a very challenging career path, and uh, you can get a lot of enjoyment out of seeing someone grasp the very basic fundamentals of just landing the airplane. It's very rewarding. I found out about the Flying Club through uh, AOPA's website. Uh, AOPA is, if you don't know, it's a uh, website and an organization that is for general aviation pilots. Uh, they sponsor events such as Sun and Fun, I believe, is sponsored by AOPA. Um, and that's a big air show down in Florida. And they go through and they give you lists of flight schools, of flying clubs, um, really anything related to general aviation. And I was in the process of doing some private pilot training and decided to look up if there were any flying clubs in the area. And that's when I found the Syracuse Flying Club and that's subsequently how I uh, met my instructor. Okay, uh, I started, my first logged hour was when I was 16 years old. I'm now 25, so you could do the math. It's nine years. Huh. Uh, the most important thing, uh, I actually learned it recently, honestly, was it's all about perspective. Um, the Just the chance to be allowed to fly an aircraft uh, is some that Peop, some individuals can't be afforded, whether it be financial issues, whether it be medical issues. Um, and it's very easy to lose track of that. So I try to make sure to remind students and people that I meet in aviation that we're doing something a lot of people don't get to do and to be grateful for it. Sure. Um, so with Financing your training, financing is usually one of the top reasons why people get scared away from aviation. Whether it be they don't have the funds readily available or they're not sure that they would ever be able to afford it. The great thing about at least the Syracuse Flying Club that I found was that the way that they do it is it's paid hourly. So every time this propeller is spinning for one hour, you're paying a certain fee. And the instructors, there's a lot of them that are the same way. Every time you're in the airplane for an hour, uh, you're paying a certain amount. So you can kind of set up a budget to do it. And that's, that's what I had the chance to do. I had to move back into my parents' house, but I mean, you know, sometimes you got to make sacrifices. Um, and AOPA actually does have some scholarships available for individuals. And there's some other associations out there, like uh, I think it's called Women in Flying or the Gay Pilots Association. Um, there's also some uh, programs out there for African-American pilots as well. AOPA's website actually is a really good source for that. Now, if you're looking at doing something more direct to the airlines. Um, there are programs out there such as AeroSim Academy. Um, you could do the collegiate route, go through college, and uh, there's federal funding available for that, grants, scholarships. There's also, um, with ATP, which is a uh, company, you can get a private loan and go through their program excuse me, program and do that. Um, financing is definitely one of the things that holds up a lot of people. And the best piece of advice I could give would be don't, don't let that hinder you from pursuing your dream. Find a way to do it. And uh, just don't break the bank with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with getting a uh, certificate, the... Well, the first certificate you have to get is your private pilot's license. 
from the starting point, you are kind of setting a path for yourself. So the first step is getting your medical certificate. Uh, to get your medical certificate, you have to go to a uh, physician that was approved by and basically sit down with them and go over any medical history you may have and find out if you qualify. Find out if you qualify to actually be in an airplane. And before you do that, I would recommend that you go and talk with a uh, flight instructor first and just make sure that you're not going to waste a couple hundred dollars on a medical. And then from there, uh, the next, depending, the next uh, process, depending on what route you take, would be either starting some home study material or if you're going the collegiate route, uh, going to your classes, the 141 side of things, and actually learning uh, the material that you need, such as you know, the forces of flight, um, how an airplane works, what drives the propeller, how it's not just magic that these things get in the air. There's actually some science behind it. Um, and learning the basics of that, followed by going up in the airplane. I always tell my students a monkey can fly an airplane. It takes a pilot to know why it's flying and how it's flying. And that's, that's really the case with all of it. And then from there, once you do your training, uh, you do your initial solo. And man, once you get to that solo point, you're, uh, you feel like a real pilot because your, your instructor is going to jump out of the plane. He's going to look at you and say, all right, it's time to go. And then you go up, go in the pattern, you do a couple laps, you come back, you're doing touch and goes all by yourself. And it's a, it's a real eye-opening experience to be like, wow, I'm actually flying this airplane. And then from there, uh, you've got some point A to point B flying you've got to achieve. And then after that, it's your check ride. And uh, you go and sit down with someone that's been designated to examine pilots from the FAA and says, okay, this person's adequately trained to fly an airplane or this person is not adequately trained or you need to do some more training. And that, that process is usually a three hour uh, oral examination with this examiner followed by a one to one and a half hour flight and uh, going up and making sure that you're gonna be safe in the airplane and you know what you're doing. So this is a Piper Archer. It is a very commonly used GA airplane. What we mean by GA is general aviation. I keep referring to that. Um, general aviation is usually something reserved for pleasure or personal business that you may have. It gets you from point A to point B without having to worry about the hassles of uh, TSA or um, you know, waiting in the long line to board the airplane. You just come out to the airplane, you get in, you go. And the Piper Archer is a uh, very, very basic airplane. It's a very good training airplane. It's a very stable airplane. What we mean by stable is it's gonna, it's not really gonna toss you around, throw you any curveballs. The landing gear stays down just like it is. The flaps come down, and uh, the propeller only sits one in one direction. You can have some more advanced airplanes that may uh, the propeller pitch can change. The wheels come up. Uh, you can have spoilers or slats that come out, and they do all sorts of things for the airplane. But the, the Archer is a very commonly used training aircraft. Um, the reason for that is its, its operating costs are generally cheap. It's a, a uh, four-cylinder, horizontally opposed engine, and it takes uh, what's called avgas which is blue in color, it's just more of a, a refined fuel for airplanes. And uh, it's very simple, there's no uh, AM, FM radio. It's, I actually believe it's a lot simpler than your car is, honestly. Uh, you don't have an air conditioner in this, you don't have uh, a MP3 player, you don't really have a uh, AM, FM radio. You have a, a radio to talk to the control tower, and you have the engine and you have an alternator to run some electrical devices and uh, some other instrumentations in it. This airplane is uh, actually more advanced than you would see in 
a uh, typical training aircraft because of this thing right here. This is our G5 or our uh, Garmin 530 GPS. Uh, this thing can do a lot for you as a private pilot and even an instrument pilot and all the way up to commercial. It has a lot of functions such as uh, getting you from point A to point B by just plugging in some information. Uh, what we used to have to do would be cross VORs which would be a ground station using these cool instruments called OBS or uh, car, called uh, uh, CDI OBS um, and then you would have your HSI over here and you would line up everything and uh, that would give you a position relative to space and you'd have this big map folded out and now we're getting away with using just uh, a good old iPad and a piece of software that's got all the map and everything on it and uh, some of these other instruments we've got our attitude indicator it's run off of a vacuum system in this airplane uh, it runs off of the principle of uh, rigidity in space so if you guys remember maybe your grandparents or you had something that span or spun and uh, you push on it well when you push on it it doesn't exactly go down right there it goes down 90 degrees ahead of where you pushed on it and it starts to wobble that's what uh, all of your vacuum gauges work off of that principle so you've got uh, your attitude indicator your HSI or horizontal situation indicator basically tells you whether you're uh, flying north, south, east, or west. Uh, you've got your turn coordinator letting you know that you're turning the airplane and uh, you've got your slip skid indicator below that letting you know if the airplane's tail is aligned with the uh, front of the airplane or if it's not. And then you've got your airspeed indicator over here, your altimeter is letting you know how high you are, uh, your VSI is letting you know whether you're climbing or descending, and we've got all of our engine instruments down here. Um, but as a private pilot, you're, you're not really paying attention to this stuff that much. You're just looking outside and using the horizon line to tell whether or not you're, you're flying straight and level or whether you're descending, climbing, turning, things of that nature. Uh, occasionally you look inside, see where everything is, and then uh, you just go straight back outside. Now this aircraft also has a uh, very simple autopilot system but uh, I, I honestly don't use the autopilot that much. So I like to actually fly the airplane instead of push buttons. Uh, and then we've got our transponder and the way I like to describe that to everyone is this is our license plate in the sky for the air traffic controller. And then you've got uh, your radio. This would be your COM2 radio, the COM1 radio or radio number one would be in the uh, GPS up here. And then we've got our switches for our lights, fuel pumps, uh, pitot heat, and then our radio panel up here, this just lets us select what radio we're using, uh, what navigation source we're using. And uh, then we also have a, uh, a DME equipment right here. This is distance measuring equipment. Um, this will allow you to know how far you are from those VORs that I was talking about earlier. Some of them have that DME information available to them. Oh, rudders, yep. Ed, do rudders. Uh, so as far as controls go, we have our yoke and a lot of people what they'll do is because they're used to flying a car or flying a car Yeah, that'd be the day a lot of people what they'll do when they get in an airplane uh, They'll take the yoke and they'll turn it left or turn it right In hopes that that's going to actually steer the airplane on the ground when in reality We've got to use these things on the floor down here called rudders and that's connected directly to the nose wheel of the airplane and that'll move the airplane left or right on the ground. And uh, when you're in the air, obviously you don't need that nose wheel anymore. It moves the rudder in the back of the airplane, which is why they call them rudder pedals. And uh, also when we're back on the ground, we gotta stop after we land. We've got brakes down here, the big middle part on the front of it. And each brake is independent of the other one. So what I mean by that is the right brake on the right rudder controls that right side. The left brake on the left rudder controls that left side. So the brake on the right hand main gear and the brake on the left hand main gear. And then we also have this parking brake that you can pull and that works both of them if you really need to, but that's not a good idea to get in that habit. Uh, we also have a flap lever down here and that moves the flaps up and down. You can actually hear it. 
We've got 10, 25, and 40 degrees of flaps, and uh, those those help the airplane slow down. They generate some drag, and they help you uh, land at a nice angle and nice and slow without having to stall the airplane. It's a good it's a good device to have in an airplane, honestly. I don't see why you wouldn't. And then we have some uh, trim tabs. We have our rudder trim tab, which helps us stabilize the aircraft so we're not having to hold back pressure on the yoke so much. That way we don't get nice uh, white hands at the end of it. And then we also have a uh, rudder adjustment. It's not really a rudder trim tab, but it helps us with the control pressures on the rudder as well. And uh, we also have carb heat if we need it. If for whatever reason we have some engine icing, we can turn on the carb heat and that'll get rid of that hopefully as we turn around and get out of there. All right, so let's talk about air conditioning. Everyone gets on these big airplanes and they're, uh, they're nice and comfy. Uh, some of the smaller airplanes do have air conditioning. This one does not, um, but it does have a uh, very nice fan that allows some air to get circulated down on the ground. They also have vents down here on the ground, or the uh, foot level rather, of the airplane that you can open. It allows fresh air to come in and circulate throughout the cabin. And then uh, you have this little window over here as well that you can open. And that allows some fresh air in while you're on the ground. But once you get in the air, obviously you want the door shut, window shut. Uh, you're relying on ram air pressure. So all that is is just pressure from the outside being forced through this little, uh, little opening on the outside of the airplane and coming in through the cabin, allowing it to cool down. And then during these winter months like we're in right now, we have a uh, superheated shroud. So what I mean by that is it's basically a uh, piece of metal goes over the exhaust, followed by a filter and another piece of metal. And you've got fresh air that comes in over that shroud and comes in contact with that superheated air and can be uh, forced through the cabin through some duct work. Allows a uh, nice toasty cabin during the winter.